Good morning. Um, I have copies of the story for next week, um, Bright Thursdays, and John's going to distribute those for us. And to those who will be participating virtually, I will send an electronic version so that John may distribute that as well. Before we begin our discourse on your engagement with Olive Senior's short story, Flying, I should like to begin by asking if there are any questions or observations uh, from our introduction last week that need to be addressed uh, for the good of the class. Yes? This is really from this week, oh. but I wonder about the role of the Catholic Church in Jamaica. Well, I yes, indeed. Um, well, the primary tradition would have been uh, the Anglican because of Jamaica becoming a part of the British Commonwealth and still is a part of the Commonwealth. Although if the current young generation of Jamaica has any influence, that may be a different relationship soon as evidenced by the most recent royal tour by Prince William and uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, given that they were not received as perhaps one would expect. But uh, in this particular story, uh, the church that is referred to is uh, the Catholic Church. And we know that because of the exorcism that is administered when Jonathan is merely six years old. And I do want us to discuss the way in which that administering of the exorcism is conducted by senior and the implications of that. It is never specifically named that. We infer that. And the reason I would argue that senior does not name it specifically is that she wants us to infer from the description of what occurs in the room with Jonathan uh, and instead of really naming it specifically, what I think she instead names is the theological violence that occurs. And it's at that moment in John Duncan's life that he is described as becoming unmoored. And it will not be until two decades later that he becomes figuratively moored when he returns to the place of his birth. So it is not a what I would consider by any means a romantic, uh, deferential representation of the church. Uh, I do not think that Father Donahoe really has any um, very, what I would call, uh, deep, angry motivation. It is done at night. Uh, Jonathan is taken away in a car at night. And it's done at the insistence of his mother. What's also worthy of consideration is that we do not have any textual evidence to suggest that there has been a thorough investigation before this act is committed. And we know that according to the church, there must be investigations over a period of time before that can actually be administered. That has not happened. And what's, I think, more noteworthy is that the the gift with which Jonathan is born is very much recognized by the community as a gift of a seer. But for the mother, who is from that tradition but has now become a part of a more uh, upward mobile, more bourgeois class, it's an embarrassment, which she refers to only as trouble. So we'll certainly look into that, but I'm glad that I'm, you anticipated part of my lecture. <laughs> <laughs>
other questions from last week's discourse or that we can address? If they should announce themselves in the course of the discussion, please, we need not stand on ceremony. In last week's class, I introduced us to Olive Sr. as a incarnational literary theological grammarian. And the title that I've given to our sessions collectively, The Grammars of the Collage, The Call, and The Clouds. In the reading for next week, Bright Thursdays, you will meet a young schoolgirl named Laura who is uh, quite, quite fearful of the clouds. And it's because of the way in which Jesus has been represented in the religious textbooks of coming to earth on clouds. And that frightens her, and she's fearful of the clouds. So that's how the title includes the, the grammar of the clouds. But today we'll focus upon the grammar of the call as presented in Flying. We had discussed last week in the portrait of Lorraine in the pain tree that in Lorraine's epiphanal moment, she arrives at an understanding, and I quote, history is not dates or abstraction, but a space where memory becomes layered and textured. What is real is what you carry around inside of you, unquote. And I submit to you this morning that Lorraine's understanding of history as not dates, not abstraction, but a space, a physical space, a concrete space in which memory is no longer relegated to the past tense, but that memory becomes palpable, if you will, in the historical present tense. And I think what the most important word in the epiphany of Lorraine is that memory becomes that memory is brought into the present tense. Memory becomes layered and textured. It assumes the contours. And there's that wonderful moment in the story today when Jonathan is reminded of the time when he was a boy and fell asleep under the guava tree. And for the first time, he feels like an actor in the narrative. And a contour line is being drawn. And that particular moment in the story, I think, very much corresponds to what Lorraine understands about history. It becomes layered, it becomes textured, it assumes a various geometry that is not monolithic, but the key word there, becoming. And Jonathan, upon returning to the land of his birth, where his spirit is restored, is very much in that final scene in the posture of becoming, because there's a wonderful narrative shift, if you've noticed, in, the, in the, the last movement of the narrative. The narrator shifts into the present tense. And so that, that sense of becoming is very much, I think, represented in that narrative shift. We meet Jonathan in the 26th year of his life upon his return to the island of his birth, with his having been in Canada for two decades. We know specifically on the map where he has been for the past two decades. But again, what we notice, Maureen, is that the actual space in which the narrative occurs for us is not named specifically on the map. We infer that it is an island. It would be a safe inference in reading this as a document in the life of Olive Senior that it is Jamaica, where she is born the seventh of 10 children. But again, there is this intentional omission of the specific geography where the story is taking place for us. It's a, it's a safe inference that it's Jamaica, but at the same time, we have no textual evidence to make that claim conclusively. Maureen? He is a, almost the same age as um, Lorraine. Yes. And she returns from yes. her, and, but he left at it, well, I mean, he was taken away at an earlier age, right. when she was only 10. Precisely. He was six or whatever. Exactly. But coming back at 25, mm -hmm. 26, mm -hmm. that just kind of hit me that they're in the same 
moment. Exactly. The two stories share that particular narrative strategy. That we meet Lorraine when she is 25 years old, having managed to be away at school for 15 years before she returns to the porch of the great house that was constructed in the 17th century under colonial architecture. We meet Jonathan, in, they are peers, if you will, uh, figuratively speaking, in his 26th year with his having left this home at the age of six. It's noteworthy that you mention that, uh, Maureen, because when he is delivered of his mother's issue, he is placed in the hands of his grandmother, Yaya. At the age of six, he is transported from his mother and his grandmother, the two surviving generations, and taken to Canada, also a part of the British Commonwealth. And he is, at that very young age, delivered, figuratively speaking, from the womb of the plain into the hands of his father. We meet him upon having been retransported to the land of his birth by way of the plain. And now we see him again in the hands of the grandmother who receives him during the delivery. It's a beautiful structural effect that Olive Sr has achieved in, in this narrative, certainly. But uh, at the age of six, when he has been subject to what we infer to be an exorcism, and the effect is that he has become unmoored. And it's then that his mother acquiesces that he can go to be with his biological father and his stepmother in Canada for two decades. And now we meet Jonathan as he is anticipating his imminent death from an illness which the narrator does not specifically diagnose for us. Again, we see on the part of Senior another intentional omission. We know not the particular place on the map, Beth. We know not the illness that has been, we infer, diagnosed by physicians, but Senior does not consider it her province as storyteller to give us Jonathan's medical history. Beth? Well, and I think, is there also an ambiguity about race also? Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that um, Yaya comes from the indigenous people yes. there in Africa. That is, that yes. is stated, actually, yes. in the story. Yes. But then his, his mother, mm -hmm. well, who was the father, mm -hmm. you know, to his mother, who, yeah. was, who was the father to him. And, and I just, I, there's always this, I even felt that a little bit with um, the pain tree. Mm -hmm. And maybe I wasn't reading things. I mean, I no, you're reading it quite astutely. To, to slavery, but at the same time, right. there was never a definition. He's, he's pale. Yes. How, how pale is he? I don't know what that Or means. is the paleness a result of his his illness, exactly. Well, the point that you make is quite significant, Beth, in that this is the geography, if you will, into which Olive Sr. is taking us. It is the geography of parent-child relationship. She takes us into the geography of social class. She takes us into the parental terrain with emphasis more on the maternal terrain, the space between parent and child, the geography of family tension, the apprehension of what one does or does not know about another. This is a much more uh, intricate, complex geography than the geography measured by the cartographer. And the point that you make is, yes, Yaya is a descendant of the Africans and who become the indigenous on the island who are now under colonial rule. They are no longer the host. They are the guest. 
And as we discussed last week, colonialism fractures the grammar of hospitality, whether one looks at hospitality from a, an ethical perspective or from a scriptural perspective. The grammar of hospitality is fractured by the colonial. And so her daughter has gone to convent school and this is very much also a parallel that we could draw biographically to Olive Senior. She is born the seventh of ten children. And as a young girl, she demonstrates uh, an intellectual creative promise for writing and for the creative arts. And her parents send her to live with relatives who are of a better financial means that could provide for her the education. This is the sacrifice that Yahya has made for her daughter to send her to a school with the nuns whereby she can learn what would then be considered all of the subjects whereby she could become a secretary and earn an income. She makes this concession to send her to the school with the nuns, believing that she'll be protected there. And unaware, the mother who becomes Jonathan's mother, leaves the cloister walls and becomes involved with an older man who becomes Jonathan's biological father and is married himself and resides in Canada. Um, so, and now when we meet Jonathan's mother, she has been married to a successful man. She has three sons, and the inference we draw is that there has been intermarriage, so there is a, it's no longer the indigenous and the colonials, there is this, what we would call, Beth, a rising middle class, the bourgeoisie, perhaps, which begs the question, where does Jonathan, what is his place? This is a study in profound displacement, is it not? He is displaced from his biological mother. He is placed with his biological father and stepmother. He is the only child there and receives their attention. But when we meet him 20 years later, having returned to his mother's home, described as a bungalow, which has very strict definition of lines, he sits at the table but he does not have a sense of place or belonging. He becomes an object that the three teenage brothers refer to as the sleeper as they bounce their balls down the halls of the bungalow. Um, and the question is, where is Jonathan's place? He is born there. He has a citizenship. He is also a subject of the crown. But it's not placement or identity by nationality or by ethnicity as much as it is according to the bonds of blood. And so we meet him displaced, certainly. When they gather at the table, there's this reference to how very short attention span they have during their conversation. It's really a study in how very uh, unreflective they are at the table. So you have Jonathan in his own geography of birth. It's as if he's in exile, certainly. And it's not until Yahya comes unannounced and she says, I am taking you back to my country. And my country is not another island. It is within this space. But I'm taking you back to my country, to the land, to the place of your birth, your genesis. Yes? OK, so oh, I love this so much. All right, so there's, there are these layers. So my family is from the Dominican Republic, uh -huh. and we are European. We are oh, Spaniards yes. mm -hmm. who came mm -hmm. in, after the Civil War, mm -hmm. the Spanish Civil War, and, and lived in the Dominican Republic. So we, my father grew up there as a Spaniard, as a Spanish kid, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I grew up there back and forth. But one of the things that I love that she does here, 
um, that I don't know if you're not familiar with the way the culture, with the way that class, race, patriarchy, Christianity, and indigenous footholds all interweave in these spaces. The, the whole thing is just a metaphor for how complex the people of the Caribbean mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. because they literally hold in their bloodline their oppressors mm -hmm. who believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were doing right because we have to save these heathens mm -hmm. because if we don't mm -hmm. they will rot in hell and if they rot mm -hmm. in hell then our souls will forever be tarnished because of that right mm -hmm. and so that comes in and then which means you have to separate them from mm -hmm. their country mm -hmm. right like she's like I'm taking you to my country mm -hmm. because my country holds the the, the beautiful practices mm -hmm. that you brought mm -hmm. but you can't take away our indigenous practices right wow. they're in our bloodline mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but then there's also this level of colorism that you know we deal with it i think on so many levels here but there it's embedded in like how black you are mm -hmm. right and so and then with your wealth compounded on it you are constantly working because the systems in place are saying that the wealthier, the more Christian, and the lighter skinned you are, mm -hmm. the further, the higher you're gonna get in mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. And the cleaner you are, the mm -hmm. less dirty you are. And so when he comes back and is with his well-to-do mama, who came from El Campo, or well, and it's not called that because I'm Spanish, but <laughs> came from the countryside uh -huh. and married somebody mm -hmm. who now she is like, mm -hmm you know, got her nails done mm -hmm. and everything's done and she is left behind her mama, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And and he holds all of this. He holds, we don't know anything about daddy, right. but we can maybe assume that daddy is white, yes. a white man yes. from yes. Canada, who yes. potentially got, you know, was working for the church, was working for mm -hmm. the was down there doing something at the convent school, mm -hmm. taking advantage of teenage girls, right? And got mm -hmm. her pregnant. Now we don't know and that. who has we the can advantage of leaving. That's right, he gets to leave. And mm -hmm. then has a wife that's willing to take this baby mm -hmm. in. We're gonna assume that mm -hmm. he is darker than who, where he's been raised in Canada. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna assume the trauma of that and the mental health struggles and all of that. And then coming back down and finding that it made me think, because I've, I've been studying indigenous history here in the United States. I mean, it's exactly what we did mm -hmm. by taking away indigenous children and putting them in these homes that now we're hearing mm -hmm. that they didn't take care of them. And we're all, like all of us, yes. every religion on the, mm -hmm. in this country is responsible mm -hmm. for that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like coming to terms with what it looks like on a personal level mm -hmm. and then bring, at least the way I've done it is I've brought it into like, where my work is mm -hmm. in in under like acknowledging mm -hmm. oh my gosh yes and then what mm -hmm. can I do mm -hmm. to to not be a part of rep right. the repetition of it to you be know an accomplice. Right. right yeah but that the colorism yeah. is such an important part mm -hmm. of that because it feeds into the mental health mm -hmm. component which is my assumption in this was that the mental health was weird. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was like it was mm -hmm. physically mm -hmm. and mental mm -hmm. illness mm -hmm. can take you down mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. and I a think physical illness. Whereas there is a discernible physical illness, unnamed, undiagnosed. The greater illness is that they took his spirit. That's right, the spirit. Right. That it it was taken with. You know, it's a profound failure in what I would call pastoral imagination, mm -hmm. and it's simply acquiescing to the. Um, narrow-minded mother who sees this as first an embarrassment and then trouble. So, and, and the point that you just made will be beautifully incarnated in next week's selection, Right Thursdays. Uh, so it's a, that's a wonderful introduction to next week's reading, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, the, um, this geography of social class and 
parental and child relationship, this geography of, of tension. And to support your point there, if this geography were to be represented on a map, a color-coded map, there could not be a single color to designate that particular um, uh, geography that serves as a senior's um, metaphor. Um, the narrator states that those who see Jonathan's emaciated body and his gray pallor know, but what specifically, definitively, conclusively do they know? They know by inference, based on their sense of vision, that he um, is ill. It's an inference which they draw. But knowing by inference and knowing by sensory perception is a knowing that is arising from an imperfect, fallible faculty of reason and sense. As the narrator states, in the subjunctive, perhaps everyone knew, family, friends, strangers on the street, everybody knew, but nobody wanted to know. So the actual condition that would be documented on a physician's report or in a case study is obviously for Olive Senior as the creator of this story, as storyteller, is quite secondary. And I think it's interesting that people see Jonathan's body and that registers upon their sense of sight that perhaps he is ill, but they do not know what the real illness is, nor can modern medicine diagnose what the condition is. It is beyond the physician. Andy. Is there almost a sense, an undertone, that the illness itself actually represents him being saddled with the sins of the mother, the sins of the father, and his whole life has been saddled mm -hmm. with. Well, there is that suggestion, I would agree very much with you, in that there is this suggestion of one generation errors in judgment or transgressions being visited on the other. Yahya, for example, is born with the gift of the call, but by her own admission, she deviates from what is thought to be her vocation in life to receive the, uh, the history from her mother and to transmit it to successive generations. It misses a generation. We have five generations here, but yet she is born with the call and believed to have the gift, but by her own admission, she deviates from that and becomes more interested in what might be considered more colonial secular matters. And now there is this effort to redeem that because there's a drought. And the river maid, they believe, has been offended. And we have here working, I think, two interesting currents of Christianity, two interpretations of Christianity. There is the interpretation represented by Father Donahoe that superstition is merely the work of the devil and that the fact that Jonathan has been born in call is a, a sign that this is a part of the, the superstitious practice and that there must be some act administered over him, hence the exorcism. But there's also another current of Christianity because Yahya refers to her church, but yet in her church, the practices of the indigenous, the heritage of the indigenous, is allowed to coexist. There's that reference that even the massa allows for the sacrifice of an animal in an effort to appease the river maid, who is the guardian of all the fonts. And so you have this very strict, uncompromising, vertical, prescriptive interpretation along with one that perhaps could be described as more descriptive and allows for 
this becoming and this adapting and this interweaving or this grafting. You know, th that's what Singer has, I think, incarnated here in terms of the representation of the Christian tradition and how it can be interpreted, you see. Um, does that stand to reason, um, Andy? Uh, but yes, there is that sense of responsibility from one generation to the next and in preserving the, the, uh, the tradition and the heritage. And the fact that there is one church in which those practices are allowed to coexist. I think it's very much like um, the Cathedral of Notre, uh, Notre Dame du Paris. The gargoyles. Remember when we studied O'Connor and I referred to her characters as American gargoyles? And the popular belief that the gargoyles were considered within the architecture to represent uh, the devil. And really, they're a part of the sewer system. They're water spouts. And they were allowed to be worked into the, the, the architecture of the cathedral because many of those who are converting to Christianity still hold on to these older beliefs. And so it was an effort to allow for a coexistence without alienating, you see. So, and I think that's, you know, what, what Senior here is very much where her sympathy lies is with the interpretation of Christianity that is practiced in the church that Yahya attends. Remember we discussed last week that from the perspective of Olive Senior that, um, and let me find the exact quotation, here it is. A very restricted, narrow Christianity combined with poverty is a ruthless combination in that narrow Christianity and poverty attack the spirit. They are both anti-life, they are both anti-freedom, and soul-destroying, unquote. And that is, that is the attack that has been done upon Jonathan. It has destroyed his spirit to the point that he has become, he feels, unmoored, displaced. Uh, Carol? Uh, I, we don't have, let's look at that scene. The way that she describes what happens in that room is left, I think, wonderfully, intentionally ambiguous. Uh, and I think what she is emphasizing by way of being intentionally ambiguous is she wants to call attention to the violence as perceived by a six-year-old boy. That particular description. Jonathan was overcome by a memory of blackness, of flying black clothes, of language cutting the air like a sword. He felt something escaping from him with a hissing sound, and then a feeling of falling, falling into a tunnel, into a kind of blankness. He must have fainted as he recollected this because he came to and found himself crying a deep and desperate sobbing for something lost. The emphasis here is not upon the actual specific language that is spoken during the exorcism. But as remembered by Jonathan at the age of six, whatever the words are, they cut like a sword, which suggests <coughs> violence. And the setting is blackness. And he feels as if he is falling into a tunnel. And he faints. He remembers. It's all about motion. The black vestments flying. The words flying and cutting like a sword. And I think what Senior has done here is to really describe Theological violence. Theological violence that occurs as a result of a failure of a pastoral imagination. Not imagining the effects that this could have on an innocent boy who is taken by night in a car placed in a dark room and he cannot comprehend the words that are being uttered. And to fail to imagine the effects upon this, this effort to alleviate the embarrassing trouble, I think, is very indicative of what Senior is describing as an inflexible, prescriptive 
theology that is applied to any moment that is considered to be embarrassing. It's a method theology, if you will, without imagining the effects of the action. And I think when we see Yahya, she is the antithesis of such an attitude. I have come to take you to my country. I grew you. I didn't raise you. I didn't rear you. I grew you. It's a much more intimate verb, is it not, than to say raised or to rear, if we use the formal colonial form of the infinitive. I grew you. There's something so wonderfully organic and intimate. And Jonathan admits in the course of his stay with her that he has never before been able to experience unconditional love. Yahya is the embodiment. She is the personification, is she not, of what you and I would refer to as unconditional love or caritas. The way that she is described in bathing him, in feeding him, in holding him, it's a variation on the mother and child, the Madonna and child, if you will. And when she takes him into her country, she takes him out of the colonial geometry and architecture in which he has lived both in the Commonwealth of Canada and where he finds himself now with his, his mother. And that is described for us so very beautifully. on page 171. In spite of the drought, in spite of the absence of rain, there is this singular moment which suggests the promise of growth and life in Yahya's country. The land here too was parched the mango tree outside his window miraculously bearing a few straggling leaves. A single bird spent much of its time perched in it. He didn't see any other birds and assumed they had died off or retreated to the high forest, for there were no bird sounds. Coming from a geometrically laid out city of high rises, he was amazed to see how soft the edges were here, how nothing seemed to have been trained or groomed, how no one thing stood out. Everything from the mountains to the country road and its high banks wound in and out, twined on or enfolded something else. Even Yahya's little house had long abandoned its vertical lines and settled comfortably into the soil, its foundations masked by the roots of peppermint and leaf of life, thyme and single Bible and croton, which she worked to keep alive. Yes? Don't you think that there's this, this return to the land, to the flourishing, to the abundance, right? Would you read for me really quickly again what you read about the the narrow-minded religion that the how narrow-minded but then how it gets woven in? Read yeah, the you, direct quotation by all. Yes, yes, yes. I, gladly. Um, I just juxtaposing that with this this abundant this abundance even in a drought. I feel yeah. like it's important. Yes. Yes. Uh, how the actual uh, landscape itself becomes relocated in the interpretation of Christianity. Right, well, and also about, like, healing. Yes. The healing power mm -hmm. of this land he's returned mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. and, and how it is, it, the, the, the spirit within that, mm -hmm. and how you talked about how 
the strict lines with mm -hmm. poverty, yes. the, that, that yes. quote about poverty. A very restricted, narrow Christianity combined with poverty is a ruthless combination in that narrow Christianity and poverty attack the spirit. They are both anti-life, they are both anti-freedom, and soul-destroying. So I, I, I interpret narrow Christianity, mm -hmm. and I see it in a lot of places here, because I think that in the wealthiest nation in the world, mm -hmm. we all live in poverty because we believe that we are in a scarcity and fear-based mindset because of mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. Christianity has often been mm -hmm. rigorously mm -hmm. pushed upon mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. to ignore mm -hmm. this abundance mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. And that in returning to what his mother clearly states as being, ugh, I'm not gonna go out to that dirty house. Right. I can't believe she still lives there. Right. We tried to buy her a new house in the city with all the fancy lines and structures and she refuses, mm -hmm. right? And then she's like, take me to, I'm gonna take you back to your mm -hmm. country. There's this beautiful vision of the lines and the poverty, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that he, that was raped from him. And in your point about the rape, it, rape is rape, spiritual, mental, physical, yeah. right? And what happened in that room, it almost doesn't matter whether we put a, what we put on it, it was a rape. Yes. It was a, it was some, somebody went into him mm -hmm. in whatever way you want to talk about that mm -hmm. and pulled out mm -hmm. a light mm -hmm. that he was born mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And I would say that all of us are mm -hmm. born with these lights mm -hmm. and that in one way, shape or another, along our path, with the best intentions of being afraid, yes. it gets pulled yes. out. Yes. And only when we release to abundance, it's mm -hmm. why we sit on Instagram and watch the tropical Instagrams. I mean, oh, with the flowers, and it's why we buy hibiscus. It's why we wanna be in the land, right? Because it offers us, mm -hmm. it's, it's healing waters, right? right? right to whatever the rigidity mm -hmm. of poverty mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And and what's so beautiful about this metaphor mm -hmm. is that these people that were, the Christ, whatever, patriarchy, it doesn't even have to be Christianity, any kind of control mm -hmm. is put on mm -hmm. someone and they are told you cannot carry mm -hmm. your indigeneity with you, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. As soon as you mm -hmm. rape them mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. all of us, we've mm -hmm. all been raped of our indigeneity in one mm -hmm. way, shape, or form, then we are in poverty. Mm -hmm. And when we can come back and bridge it, mm -hmm. right? And the spirit comes back into us, mm -hmm. and then there's the balance of it, then mm -hmm. that is where, that's when, we, that, that's literally, I feel like what he's show, what mm -hmm. she is showing us mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. this transformation, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. metamorphosis, mm -hmm. this life, mm -hmm. death, rebirth mm -hmm. experience. And we all like, have the capacity to like put ourselves in this story mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. but i love the the juxtaposition of that mm -hmm. rigidity yes. and this everything just falls away mm -hmm. and it just becomes abundant right. and soft and healing yes mm -hmm. yes well and and to your point the the interpretation of christianity that is represented by Father Donahoe and to which Jonathan's mother ascribes is what I would describe as a very literal Liquor. method and an impoverished theology. Yeah, absolutely. So there is the poverty of the land, there is the economic poverty, but I think Senior is calling our attention to a greater poverty and that is a theological impoverishment as practiced by those who have brought Christianity to the island. Whereas, there, but there is, there is hope in that there is one church, one congregation, to which Yahya, in which there is allowed this coexistence, and you juxtapose the literal prosaic against the interweaving, which is more poetic. You're talking about the balance. It's in the balance that we find metaphor. It's in the balance that we find possibility, if you will. So it's a, it's a very acute juxtaposition, which she, which she shows, as opposed to proclaiming in a very didactic way, it's shown. And as we discussed last week, as a writer, 
Senior thinks that her primary responsibility is to initiate a contract and to bring to one a story, but not to explain it, not to interpret it conclusively, definitively, but in the contractual relationship, there is the honoring of the experience that a reader brings, and there is the honoring of the reader's intelligence as well. And hence, her, in a, her, her ability, her intention, of allowing herself as a writer to lean into ambiguity and to resist literalism, certainly. That takes courage as a writer, as an artist, knowing when one in one's limited omniscience has completed one's part of the contract to simply tell the story. And I just split an infinitive to tell the story simply. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my, if I, my students at Vanderbilt did that, I would have had a, a profound effect on my nervous system. <laughs> so, you, can, you can now hold that against me. <laughs> um, it's on the internet right now. I know. I know. <laughs> Someday, will you do like a little grammar review of your okay. of us who are like, I think I know what that means, but I can't remember. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's one, of my, it's one of the things I caution them in their writing when they turn their essays in, don't split your infinitives. Check it. And here I contradict myself and split the infinitive. King's English, please. Pardon? King's English. King's, King's English, English, yes. <laughs> King's English, yes. Um, this description of the geometry of Yahya's dwelling in contrast to a geometrically laid out city of high rises he was amazed to see how soft the edges were here. Nothing seemed to have been trained or groomed or colonized. How no one thing stood out but this beautiful coalescence and blending, a rather panoramic view. Everything from the mountains to the country road and its high banks wound in and out twined on or enfolded something else, even the way in which she has written this sentence with the use of the M dash and the pauses suggests this wonderful interweaving in coalescence. The actual syntax echoes the effect that the narrator is describing. Even Yahya's little house had long abandoned its vertical lines and settled comfortably into the soil. Its foundations masked by the roots of peppermint and leaf of life, thyme and single Bible and croton, which she worked to keep alive. This is wonderful. The vertical lines of her house have begun to be relaxed from the linearity and the architectural exact geometry of where his mother lives and where his father in Canada lives, we now come into this dwelling in which the vertical lines are being relaxed and the foundation of the house is masked by the wonderfully invasive peppermint and single Bible aloe vera and croton. Remember last week, when Lorraine returns home, she stands on the steps of a house, the foundation of which can be traced to the 17th century colonial architecture. This will be her inheritance, and her mother wants her to restore the house to its grandeur. That the architecture of the colonial. And here, in this beautiful, simple dwelling, where the vertical lines are receding, and the foundation is covered by the wonderfully invasive herbs indigenous to the land, which his grandmother works to grow, not to weed because of how invasive they are, but to encourage the growth, you see. It's a different geometry, certainly here. And the vertical lines are beginning to recede. When Jonathan is reminded of the story when he was six years old, of his going to look for the perfect guava, and he falls asleep, um, 
He remembers that story vaguely, but what he most appreciates is that he's the actor, he's the protagonist. This is someone who sits at the table in a blended family, but doesn't feel as if he has a place. That story from his past is one in which he is the protagonist, and he, he describes it as a contour line. A contour line is the outline of a body. It's the elementary outline before it's all filled in. It's, and I think what he's described here is that if he feels like a contour line, that there is that which can be filled within him. The spirit can return, if you will. And that contour line of Jonathan and the relaxed verticality in Yahya's dwelling, it's in these two geometric figurations, if you will, that there is the suggestion of a restoration, which Senior does indeed permit Jonathan to experience. And the exorcism is now countered by the two elders who come and who prepare the herbal medicinal potions that Jonathan imbibes. And then we shift into the present tense. And we know not if Jonathan has passed, if he has crossed, we know not, and we need not know. What's important that we know is that the spirit has been restored by the intercession of the grandmother who embodies Caritas and the two elders of the community. Jonathan is born in call which means when he is delivered of his mother's issue into the hands of Yahya, he is enclosed fully in the amniotic sac. When the sac is broken, the, the membranes will lie over the child's face in call. And we, it's a word that is etymologically related to a, a, a religious word, cowl as a monk's cowl, the call. It's, it's also can refer to a helmet. But from the grammar of the indigenous, to be born in call is a sign that one's parents will be prosperous and that the child will be very special, have prophetic gifts of the seer, and will never drown. But you see, this is the grammar of the indigenous. This has as its antecedent that which is older than Christianity. And it's an antecedent that they honor still. But yet, in the Western grammar, to be born in call is perceived to be a very bad it has the complete opposite reaction, you see. And so we have this tension, this conflict, between these two grammars interpreting the birth of Jonathan. But it's so, I think, so very beautiful, structurally and theological, that he is delivered into Yahya's hands, and it's those hands that receive him. And it's through her hands that he experiences for the first time what he can now, in his 26th year, name as unconditional love, caritas. So, when we contrast Yahya's capacity to love in contrast to the biological mother and father, when we contrast the hands of Yahya with the perfectly manicured hands of his biological mother as they rest upon the leather-covered wheel of her Mercedes Benz. <laughs> she, is, she is taking him to her country where there are still vestiges of, of the heritage alive. And it's not in total conflict either because the last rites were performed 
but they were the last rites of a, a different tradition yes. by the, the brothers, yes. uh, Nebo and mm -hmm. Sam. And, and then he, he seems to undergo this kind of confession mm -hmm. where everything that his old world was is, is out. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wouldn't think that, I would think more confession than exorcism mm -hmm. in this spot. Um, but yeah, I, I love this. And then, okay, so this may be really reaching. But what about the call and then the call of the bird yes, yes, yes. to invite him to fly? Yes, the bird, re the bird of his youth returns. You know, when he is lying in, in bed, he notices the absence of birds. But in the final movement, in the shift to the historical present tense, the bird returns. Jonathan's gift is that the animals speak to him and tell him what to prophesy. And the bird returns in the end. And the rain returns in the end as well. The drought is over. And drought here functions multivalently. There is a drought in the interpretation of Christianity as represented by the mother and father Donahoe. But there is a flooding, if you will, in the tradition of Yahya. The bird returns and speaks. And what's wonderful, you know, Beth, in that, in that final scene, it's not far-reaching because there is a death and resurrection. There is a birth. There is a resurrection of the spirit. There is, Jonathan is now as he was until that very violent day when he is six years old. And as he looks at the mountains, we see how they're becoming translucent. And he finds the guava, and he, he eats the fruit, and it's without worms. He has found the perfect guava. The mountains are becoming translucent. There is a transformation. There is a transfiguration that is occurring within him, that is occurring within nature as he experiences nature. So it's not far-reaching. There is a resurrection. There is a birth, a rebirth that is occurring. There is a sense now of being whole. And Jonathan, perhaps, is about to fly. And we don't know, because Singer does not consider it her province, if he will have a safe landing. <laughs> but she has written him to the moment which is the moment to which she, as an artist with limited omniscience, can write. It's like writing to the comma, writing to the pause, writing to the M dash, or to the elliptical phrase, that it's possible, you see. If he, has if he has died and crossed into the eternity, that's not explained conclusively, but she writes him to the m moment where there is the promise of ascent, and that's masterful well, and the and how she explains and I feel like it's a message to us that in in the micro work that we are undergoing in our own transformation mm -hmm. spiritual mm -hmm. that that ripples out into the macro yes. as he is having this transformation yes. Yes. the water is coming yes. down right yes. that that mm -hmm. just seeing that together as he eats the guava he can hear mm -hmm. the gully filling with water mm -hmm. and the river may return mm -hmm. and it's just a simple like message mm -hmm. to us all that every time we do the work to to con reconnect ourselves mm -hmm. to our spirit mm -hmm. to what ground that mm -hmm. in that we literally change the face of the earth yes. on these microcosmic levels yes. and then that when we're all doing that and it literally raises us all. Yes. There's an efficacy yeah. there of yeah. always becoming, if you will. Right. Back to always becoming. Yes, she exactly. Started this with. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. And this, this birthing of Jonathan, the restoration of Jonathan, it occurs in a space in which, as Lorraine says, memory is layered and textured. You know, it's in that particular moment, the voices of the ancestors are audible in the present. It's in that moment. It's a sacramental metaphysic of time in which the linear tenses collapse. Yes. And the voices of the past are present in the, the voices of the past are present in the present and has an efficacy for the future. 
So it's really what she has done there is, I think, to, to write in her own way the inexhaustible geometry of a sacrament. You know, the, the sacramental metaphysic of time, you know, we never speak of sacraments in the past tense. We never speak of miracles in the past tense. They occur in particular moments in chronology, but the effects, the consequences, are never relegated to the past tense. But you, you, cannot, you cannot conjugate the infinitive to be efficacious and then split this one <laughs> in the past tense. <laughs> so, so, and that's, you know, and I think what this allows us to infer is that what Senior has demonstrated for us is what I've always held very closely to my own vocation is, and that is art has a sacramental efficacy. So we are past time, as usual, in a class with me. Uh, and uh, but what I would also close with is that description of Yahya's home with the receding vertical lines and where John the narrator says that all the edges seem soft. It's like a collage that we discussed last week. You know, the grammar of the call, the grammar of the collage converge here. And next week, we'll look at the grammar of clouds. So thank you. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.